yeah, the only thing I wanted to talk about left there was this idea of consent, express, and tacit, and the difference between the two. Um, you know, Locke says that people can um, consent to their government either through express means or by tacit consent. And of course, express is the direct participation. Okay, in the in the original social contract, it's actually you know the consent in the social contract. But afterwards, which is what most people are living in, is they're already living within a government. How do they give their consent? Well, you know, one way is to go and vote for um, your representatives in parliament, and that would be express consent, right, or participation, or so he would argue. Um, or another way, which is what I want to talk a little bit about, is simply by staying and obeying and cooperating with the laws of the land. Okay? And that's tacit. That's tacit okay. consent, right? Um, implicit and it would be another word to use, implicit consent, simply by your behavior. And I wanted to ask you what you thought about that. Is, is either one of them good enough? I have a couple of examples in your handouts here. One of express consent would be voting for representatives, but you could say participate in the process because you feel you should out of necessity, but be completely unhappy with the form of government. Okay. Is, it, is it good enough, in other words, to say you vote, therefore you consent to this form of government? I would say no, because like the way that our government is set up, even like, I guess for presidential elections, saying you can go out and vote, but your vote doesn't actually count because the person in the Electoral College that is for your district doesn't have to vote the way that that's the majority true. of people vote. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's the way it's set up. So it's, it's kind of pointless almost mm -hmm. to do something like that with, you know, not, uh, with like, you know, Senate elections, that kind of thing. I don't know too terribly much about how the voting process goes with that, mm -hmm. but I mean, it's direct in that case. Okay. The Electoral College is the only, it only applies to the, the presidency. But, and they, in recent memory, they've always voted the way that their people, but it is a winner takes all type of situation. It's not proportional. So if, let's say, 51% or 50.5% 50 of a state votes for this particular candidate, or in a three-way race, if you know that this candidate gets forty percent, but the other two get less, okay, that the electoral representatives will then cast the entire vote for the one who wins. So that this is part of the problem with the electoral college system, I guess, if you want to see that direct representation for the presidency. Um, and you're right that they don't have to do that. Um, I think if they ever, at this point, didn't vote for the winner, that we would probably get rid of the Electoral College, right? But it is an indirect yeah. process and it doesn't fully represent, and there are some scenarios in which a candidate could win the majority of the popular vote and not win the presidency because of the like Electoral College. Al Gore, college. Yeah. George Bush, 2000. Yeah. yeah, right? I do kind of also feel like like with the tacit consent, mm -hmm. like that would be like not voting and simply staying. But from what I've seen recently with like, I guess people my age is that when people don't go vote, it's not because, okay, I don't care. It's because I don't like either of them. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to vote for either of them. Mm -hmm. But then that's not really consenting. That's just, oh, that crazy. that's yeah. more <laughs> abstention than anything else. Yeah. So, people so people are angry and crazy. they don't participate, but they still live here and they still obey the law and you know have a job here and pay taxes and all of that stuff and Locke would say that that is tacit consent that as long as you you may be disgruntled and not completely happy or disaffected like that you know not wanting to vote for anybody but you're not fomenting rebellion you're not either leaving the country or you know deciding that you're gonna gonna try to change it somehow so his bar for consent is pretty low, mm -hmm. okay? Well, because that's what I was going to say is like, I mean, it's kind of a shrewd thing, but well, if you're unhappy, why don't you run kind mm -hmm. of thing? I mean, that's not reasonable in this day and age, or probably ever mm -hmm. for the majority. Um, but I think then the other one is that 
like you have to have a, like you have to have an exit. Maybe that's just Socrates, who's like if, if you're unhappy, you gotta have a way to leave if it's a legitimate government. But if you can't, then it's not. Yeah, and then if you think about that, if you if you, if if to show your lack of consent, you have to leave. That's a pretty big burden to place on somebody. Yeah. So mm -hmm. their entire family may live here. They have a job here. Um, to leave and go someplace else might make their situation worse. Mm -hmm. You know, In cases they can't leave because I mean, where where are you going to go? That's just going to let you, let you. Hey, just come and join our country. We right. don't care. I mean, there's rules and regulations. There's mm -hmm. you have to go through crap ton of procedures. <laughs> To yes, get you know your nationality switched over, mm -hmm. and then you might end up in a similar situation in any other country where you didn't feel like you were fully represented, right? So it's it's a you know I guess this this is a real fundamental and eternal problem with any sort of representative system is that actually most people most of the time are not going to be completely happy. And Locke is basically willing to live with that. What he, what he says is, if people get riled up to the point where they will actually take action, that's the point at which they withdraw their consent. Up to that point, if they're operating at that within point, the system. he says it's okay, right? Yeah, he at says it's point, okay. It would be okay. Mm -hmm, absolutely, it's okay. And, but prior to that, basically we have to accept the fact that any form of government is far from ideal and that there will be people that will not be happy or will not be completely happy but won't want to go anyplace else. Okay. Um, now Rousseau will take issue with that, with the whole idea of majoritarianism, the idea that you know, most people most of the time are not going to be completely happy. And he will try to figure out how you have a system in which people actually will, where the, well, actually where all people will feel as though they are truly represented by all the decisions of their government. And that's a very, very tall order, but Locke does not go there, and it, it is a pretty low bar. Um, and later on, when he starts talking about revolution, he makes it clear again, he says, you know, the government has to do an awful lot to get people to the point of wanting to actually physically take up arms or and or leave the country. And this is okay, you know, because you shouldn't go to war, you shouldn't rebel for light reasons because there's a lot of costs involved in rebellion and you don't know how it's going to end up. <clears throat> so you should only do it if people are actually feeling quite desperate. Okay. That's why it's an interesting question to ask yourself would Locke have thought the American Revolution was a good revolution or a, a um, I guess, reasonable revolution? Yeah, I wonder what you would think. I, I would say yeah, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Because why? I don't know. I mean, just with how low, since we talked about you know how low his bar for consent is, I think that mm -hmm. everybody got heavily upset enough. Mm -hmm. At that point, it was becoming sort of tyrannical, in a sense, mm -hmm. kind of against his view of absolute monarchy. That's the way people felt here, yeah. mm -hmm. that they were being taxed and they were quartering the soldiers and doing all of these things, but they weren't being allowed to be represented, and this is one of the basic ideas Locke has about I what think, it takes. Yeah, I think if he lived in America, he would have supported mm -hmm. been an American, or been a colonist, I think he would have supported it pretty heavily and been a pretty big advocate for it. Okay. They used his reasoning. Yeah. They did use his reasoning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you if you had a group of people in England that were being treated like the American colonists, would that have made a difference? Or I mean, is there any difference based on the fact that we were here across the ocean and not living there? that made this a little bit more acceptable or a little less of a problem than it would be if we lived there. I think we would have had to, like, there, there would still have, like, seen a revolution or, like, a rebellion in England, but whereas, like, we became an independent country, they would probably just get a new, like, ruler, new mm -hmm. set of Yeah, I think that'd be really, that's actually really interesting, because I wonder if we would have stayed if we would not have came over if yeah. necessarily would have been a rebellion. Because 
I, I really, I, I don't know if I can answer that. That's tough. Well, if there had been more toleration at that point, uh -huh. which is another thing Wright's about, um, you know, then maybe people wouldn't have come over here or felt the necessity to. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wonder if, if we weren't talking about the whole country, but we were talking about one pocket of it, or like in the United States, if there was one state or one small region that, yeah, <laughs> that wasn't being represented like they wanted to be, um, or was really being ill-treated, it would probably not be enough because they're, they might try to secede, like Texas might actually try to secede or something like that. But as far as rebelling, they wouldn't be able to do it, right? Without most of the rest of the country, a, a good number of people, um, at least they wouldn't be able to rebel in the way that Locke envisioned it occurring, you know? I feel like this might be like one of those like size matters kind of things, because like mm -hmm. if you had a small country, Finland, they have like five million people, you can get five million people, I mean, a good number of the five million people to say like, hey, we're not happy. We have like 300 million people, there's no way, like yeah. in Texas, yeah. probably like 15, I don't know, right. million. Yeah, and more uniformity, you might say. The more diversity there is in, I don't know, every way, then, you know, the, the more likely it is you're not going to get that type of agreement. Um, so, yeah, I just, I, I have a feeling that if certain minorities, like if those, those Puritans had stayed in England and lived in a particular part of England and didn't like what was going on or didn't feel like they were fully being given their freedoms or representation, it wouldn't have been enough because they wouldn't have been able to get the, the you know, the cooperation of the majority of people necessarily. And you have Northern Ireland and Ireland, and I mean, they're mm -hmm. it's kind of a similar situation where they, That's true. the Catholics weren't happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, in, in that situation, they caused a lot of trouble for a long period of time. They still have, you know, there's still... Yeah, I was going to say, isn't there still tension yeah. over there? Yeah, and this is, this is, you know, I think, as you'll see when we get to the, the uh, revolution part, what he would like to see is that you only do this if you have a very good chance of winning and consolidating and, and basically making a fresh start. But to have this in, in Northern Ireland, it dragged on and on and on and on because they were facing the power of a state that was really much more powerful than themselves. And they used um, terrorist tactics and they used guerrilla tactics out of weakness because they couldn't, um, you know, frontally confront uh, Great Britain. Uh, so I don't know what Locke would say about that. I'm not sure he would, I, I, could, because he says the costs are very high for mm -hmm. this type of action, and in that case they were, you know, for, for decades. Um, people died, people lived without security, people couldn't grow their businesses that he's so concerned about, you know, um, like they could have if there had been security and so forth. So um, he doesn't want this to happen real frequently, which is, it's, just a, it's, it's something to keep in the back of your mind because we associate him so much with this right to revolution, but he does put a lot of blocks in the way. And, you know, says that in, in effect, this shouldn't happen unless, unless you can pretty much guarantee that it will be successful and that you'll be able to move on, create a new stable government, and begin afresh. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so. Let's talk about chapter 9, um, which is entitled, Of the Ends of Government. Um, there he says the number one end of government is the preservation of property. But remember, property is, is um, defined really broadly. I mean, well, it's not defined the way we would. You know, we think of our home or our car or our clothes and whatever we own as property. He includes all of that, but our first and foremost property is our, in our bodies, okay? which for whatever reason we don't tend to think, you know, it, it, it's another case where Locke deviates from pure religious heritage as well, because part of the reason why people don't tend to call their bodies their property is because we think of ourselves partly as you know, spiritual beings or something that isn't quite just material. Um, but when it comes to our legal system, we, we do to a certain extent. 
Um, so he starts with the body and then the freedom of the body, right? The freedom that we have to move about as we please, to express ourselves as we please and so forth. And then the property that we accumulate as well. So this is the number one and really by far, well, it's where everything else extends from. Everything else comes from that right to the preservation of property. Now, then he talks about what means government must have to make that happen, to preserve property. And <clears throat> so on page 320 on the right-hand side, he has three things that are necessary. <clears throat> First, he says, there wants an established, settled, known law received and allowed by common consent to be the standard of right and wrong and the common measure to decide all controversies between them. Okay. Just to clear things up real quick, mm -hmm. these means, uh, through the means to preservation of property, of is property. That correct? Mm -hmm. okay. Right. These are the powers that government has to have. Um, secondly, in the state of nature, there wants a known and indifferent judge with authority to determine all differences according to the established law. So you need a known and indifferent judge. What does indifferent mean in this instance? There's no stakes in the conflict. Mm -hmm. so he's not the one suing you. Right, no conflict of interest, yeah. And also just no bias. So, you know, in Locke's day, uh, the most common bias was for the aristocracy, for the wealthy. And literally, um, you know, they could get away with more. <laughs> the laws didn't apply equally to, e mm -hmm. to people. So this is a big step up if it could be done, where the laws apply equally to everybody and the judge truly is indifferent to, to class and even to gender. So this is um, a pretty radical idea. It is, yeah. it really yeah. is, right? I mean, if you really fully applied this and getting back to the issue of marriage and everything, this would mean you'd have to put an end to the different laws you know, how men can basically own property but women can't, or men can sue for divorce under certain circumstances and women can't. And then finally he says, third in the state of nature, there wants a power to back and support the sentence when right and give it due execution. So that's the ex executive power. So you have the legislative, the judicial, and the executive power. Okay. It seems like he... I don't know if he does this on purpose, but the reoccurring theme of a indifferent judge that keeps coming up and mm -hmm. he keeps stressing the importance of that, did the judiciary almost mean the most to him? Um, it doesn't turn out to mean okay. the most to him, even though there's a great stress on it. The legislator, legislature I just noticed means, it a lot. Well, it's, yeah, yeah I mean, it, it reflects his change in what the law should be about, what kind of laws ought to be okay. made. Um, but the, when, he, when he discusses the roles of these various powers, the judiciary doesn't have that discretion that the American judiciary has, for instance, okay. where, where it can decide to interpret the laws according to the Constitution or something like that. Instead, the legislature has to make good laws. And so, you know, they have to be laws that can be applied to all equally. Um, but yeah, I think the reason why he discusses the indifferent judge is because, and uses that term so much, is because he wants the spirit of the laws to be indifferent okay. as well. Um, okay, so we have the three powers of government. They are not three branches of government in the, the way that we think of them in the United States, with three separate powers, okay? And this will become more clear as he continues to discuss them. But it's more like, um, like you have the legislature here which represents the people, and you've got the judiciary as one arm of the legislature which applies the laws in cases, okay? when people are in disputes or when people commit crimes. And then you've got the executive, 
that enforces the laws made. And the executive is going to be indifferent too, in the sense that he's going to, he or it is going to enforce the laws equally, not going to make exceptions for people. It's going to, they're going to be equally applied to all. So everything starts with the legislature. Mm -hmm. Everything that. starts with the legislature because it is the representative of the people. Okay. And it's got the supreme power. These two work for the legislature more or less. Okay. So in our system, they have a separate power, right? And they can check and balance each other. And that was necessary in the view of the founders to make sure that no one branch got the upper hand. It's scary to think if this is how our <laughs> government would be set up today. I would be very scared. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a good way to, to think of it, right? And because what, what's going on in your imagination? I'm glad that they did not take this direct approach to walk. That's, I'm glad our founding fathers did not do that. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are you thinking that they would do if they had all their power? Oh, my I don't know if we would have survived this long. I'm serious. I don't know if we would have. Mm -hmm. I think we would have up until about the 60s. I mean, they're probably still slavery. Just, yeah, probably. Yeah, uh -huh. that brings a very good point. Because a lot of Congress during the Lincoln era did not support the idea of ending slavery. So that's that's, that's true. Wow. Yeah. Wow. What things would be totally in segregation would mm -hmm. still be in effect then. They represent the majority. Mm -hmm. So I would. You and I wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. Don't right, that. right. We wouldn't have the same rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And isn't that just? It's scary is, to is think. Is the legislature supposed to be partial in his view? Well, it's or is it? It's supposed to be <laughs> impartial. Okay. However, and this is the, the the whole theory versus practice problem that comes up throughout political thought. What is possible in theory? may not be possible in practice. You know, you can say all you want, they should be objective, they should make laws that apply equally to all. But when they're elected, and you know how elections go, I mean, they're based on a lot of things other than just the will of the people voting. Um, and those people get into that position of power, that doesn't mean that they're always gonna do that. And I think that's where, you know, the skepticism of the founders about the, the, the I guess, the, the well-meaning nature of our representatives um, is, is what prodded them to create these extra checks in the system. And what, what Locke is thinking is, well, these are the people that are going to represent, they're representing the people, so they're the closest to the people. And if the people don't like what they do, then they can, you know, they can not elect them next time. That would be the moderate thing to do. Or if they really, if the legislature gets totally out of hand, they can always rebel and change the government. We probably so, would have went through many states of rebellion if this would have. Yes, it, it yeah. would be unstable. We would have had multiple civil wars, I bet. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, I guess if you think about it, the places that kind of did, like, Parliament, they'd have had multiple civil wars, right? Yes, they have. Yeah, that's places. right. Where the, the you know, like during like the Hobbes' time. I feel like the development of the states would definitely mirror more closely that of Britain through time, and we wouldn't, mm -hmm. we definitely wouldn't be as modernized as we are today. Just no. Yeah. Right. The more the more energy to... is spent on internal conflict, the less energy you have to put into building and growing and economic and this is exactly what what Locke wanted was for you know the private realm to expand you know for there to be enough uh, stability that, that that could be done but I think it's partly because of the point in time that he's at he's he's living in a time where they're breaking away from monarchy where monarchy seemed to be the biggest impediment to growth and to stability and to freedom and so forth and Maybe he can't quite imagine, or look, well, let's put it this way. He can much more imagine a king becoming a tyrant than a legislature becoming a tyrant. And maybe he didn't study Plato as well as he should have, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, or maybe he thought that by this point in time, through the representative as opposed to the direct democracy, people would have a different, you know, point of view 
about government and about their role in it, and it was different enough that that wouldn't happen. That's probably the case. I think, you know, he would have said, "I've made a great innovation in that I'm, you know, we're talking about representation at this point, not just, just like people voting on." Blowing my mind right now. <laughs> How different it could have been. I want to emphasize it because people, because they know that Locke's ideas mm -hmm. had a great influence on our founders. They really thought Locke was the originator of separation of powers and checks and balances, and that's not true. Yeah. I'm glad our founders didn't really skip yeah. over some. Yeah, yeah. 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 modified it. Yeah, they definitely they used some of his ideas and principles. Well, they it seems like he was halfway the there. Yes, mm -hmm. he was right. halfway there. He was mm -hmm. very close to it. Yes, he had. He, the, he had the idea there. Mm -hmm. So he has the three branches, the three uh, separate functions. Later on, he talks about a federative power as well, which is the um, foreign policy, the power of foreign policy, which he does not make a separate institution either. That's, you know, I, well, we'll get to that one. We'll this just, just shows like how like genius our founders were though. Mm -hmm. that, that's incredible to take this idea and go further with it because I'd had to take a while to develop, I bet. It took a lot of hard yeah. work, I think, yeah. yeah, and a lot of study. They they studied both ancient and modern political thought. They were true political philosophers in their own rights, and these people, but especially Madison, that was yeah. really yeah. the most, yeah, right. Um, so we have a lot to thank. It may not be a perfect government, but it seems to be way more lasting and stable than a lot of other ones. Isn't that what Dr. Frankie used to say? He said the foundations are solid, but Low. Low. Yeah. yeah, right, right. So they don't expect people to rise to great heights of either character or religiosity or anything like that, and they, they put those in the private realm. Locke helps develop that thought, okay, because he too, with his discussion of toleration in particular, um, puts character issues into the private realm and takes them out of the public hands, which does, that, that was a great inspiration for the founders. Um, because until then, you've got the, the number one cause of civil war in Europe, right? And wars generally, religion. Yeah. Um, so he, he does manage to do that, and we have him to think for that, thank for that. Um, Madison's today. Yeah. What was that? I can't have any Madison's. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I think they knew that that was rare. That's why they didn't want to bank on wise people being in charge of government. And let's face it, back then it was easier for those people to emerge because we were at the beginning where new ideas could, people could entertain very new and sometimes radical ideas because everything was kind of up for grabs and a little bit unstable. Whereas now, you know, there's a lot to lose, there's a lot to hang on to, and people who have new ideas tend to be looked upon with some fear. And that's natural, that's a natural development. The longer that you have a country in, in existence with the same constitution, I think the more, I'll use this term in a generic sense, the more conservative people become about change. You know, and so, you know, you do have those people. Those people are still out there. But whether people will, will entertain their ideas and whether they can be in positions of power, you know. And I think that Madison thought, for the most part, we were better off without them if the system run, if it could run well, you know, with the selfish interests and the, the cynical compromises and all of that stuff, it's kind of, not too pretty, but it does work. <laughs> but I know what you mean. Um, yeah, I think that the danger we run into is that the American people will not be inspired, you know, and will not continue to be citizens in the truest sense. They withdraw like your friend who doesn't vote, right? Or you, if <laughs> it's, I don't know. <laughs> um, and that's not good because if enough people don't participate, then we do run the risk of, of losing the system, mm -hmm. you know, of it changing and, and becoming something else. Um, I think they'd be appalled with the voting issue today, some of them would. Yeah, I think they probably would because they'd wonder, well, how much do you value your freedom, right, yeah, if you exactly. don't, 
want to participate. Yeah. yeah. It's not like they weren't aware of politicians being kind of self-serving. Yeah. I mean, there were plenty of self-serving politicians in England, for instance, yeah. they would have known all about. And even here, I mean, as the uh, states, um, first the colonies and then the states uh, started to really coalesce their politics, there's plenty of that going on, you know, not, not uh, well, there was even class-based politics going on for sure, you know, property and class-based politics. So it's always been around. It's not like it's something that we're suffering from that hasn't always existed. But that cynicism is, it's troubling. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of our politicians actually do believe in something. They're not perfect people, but we, we tend to take an idea that we have of the kind of corrupt politician and put it on to all politicians, you know yeah. what I mean? Not all of them are like Frank Underwood. <laughs> right, <laughs> definitely not like Frank Underwood. <laughs> that would be scary. Speaking of which, um, I have a student who went off to Duke Law School and I noticed that he's done two mini shows now on YouTube. Really? Yeah, and they're called School of Laws, and it's a parody on the House of Cards. Oh, really? That's he awesome. stars in it. That's so awesome. you want to look on YouTube and, and look for the School of Laws. His name is Todd Noley. Okay. They're very funny. <laughs> he does a great, he doesn't look anything like Frank Underwood, but his accent is actually spot on. Very oh, nice. Wow. Yeah, he's having a good time at Duke. He'll probably get a good job. All right, so. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, I'm thinking he's going to graduate package soon. over there. <laughs> um, all right, well, one more thing before we go. Um, this issue of property and, and, you know, it being most important, of course, means that government can't take it without our consent. And this is, you know, what the whole American Revolution was about in a way, right? So definitely they got some inspiration here. Um, Oh, so man. he yeah. would be appalled to eminent domain today. Oh, he would hate that. Yeah, oh. he would absolutely hate that. Um, there's very few reasons why a government should ever take people's property like that. About the only one that Locke would probably think okay would be war. Mm -hmm. You know, in the case of absolute exigency, when there's no other case, you can take what you need. But you know, otherwise, no. Um, this teaching is on 325. Uh, paragraph 142. He's got uh, four criteria here for government as far as their laws. Um, he says they are to govern by promulgated established laws not to be varied in particular cases. Okay, we know that. One rule for rich and poor. Secondly, those laws ought to be designed for no other end ultimately but the good of the people. That's where that optimism comes in that you guys are skeptical of. You know, yes, that's a nice thing to say, but you know, and it's a nice standard to hold them to. Okay, third, they must not raise taxes on the property of the people without the consent of the people given by themselves or their deputies. And this properly concerns only such governments where the legislative is always in being, that is, it's always able to meet or at least where the people have not reserved any part of the legislation, legislative to deputies to be from time to time chosen by themselves. Okay, so this is, it's very basic. In other words, and really, he would always prefer, obviously, that there be a legislature selected by the people. So, um, and they should not raise taxes without the consent of the people. Now later on he gives a reason why, but basically it amounts to this. If you could take away people's money, and that's their property, you can take their property without their consent, you have the ultimate power over their lives. So it's a direct threat to their self-preservation. The government can impoverish them to the point of starvation, it can make them destitute. So this is like slavery. Okay. He equates um, this kind of government that could do that with slavery. Fourthly, the legislative must neither, neither must nor can transfer the power of making laws to anybody else. Okay. 
So I have a question there about would a monarchy fulfill these requirements? It's probably kind of a rhetorical question in a way. <laughs> it would have to be the type of monarchy that, that England now has, right, with a figurehead monarch. Or, or the monarch could be the executive there, which is what I think he's envisioning, that you still have a king, but he becomes the executive, which is under the legislature and can't do this, for instance, can't have the power of making laws transferred to him. Mm -hmm. Because he can't do that, you have to have a legislature that can always meet. Okay? Now, he will say they shouldn't meet all the time. That's one of his checks on an exec legislative power. They should only meet from time to time. <laughs> but that's up to them. Okay? They decide when they're gonna meet. The way it was, uh, was the king decided when they were going to meet. And a lot of problems were caused by the king deciding they didn't need to meet for years. <laughs> um, so, again, the power is in the legislature. And yes, it, it's nice to tell them, but you should only meet several times a year so you don't get out of hand. But you can't really, you can't make that happen. There's no check, okay? Um, but no any traditional monarchy would not fulfill these requirements, okay? Now, we don't really have enough time to deal with this, so next time we'll come back okay. and deal with the military service question, because on the same page on 325 on the left-hand side, he makes an exception of this property requirement of the military, basically saying it's okay and justifiable for the military to require somebody to risk and give their life for their country. That makes him different than Hobbes, and we'll have to talk about exactly what's going on there.